Good afternoon, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. It's a sunny, very, very chilly day in Portland, Oregon here. We are in zone 8B and that means it is very far from our last frost state. We had full spring um, and that meant we had temps in the high 50s and the low 60s and a number of folks got fooled into planting things out way too early. So if you are somebody who made the mistake of being tempted by the weather to plant out those kind of tender plants and you're worried about losing them now, um, try and be gentle with yourself. Gardening is about 20% failure in a good year. There's just so much that's outside of our control, but I would really encourage you to know your climate zones, know your first and last frost dates, and don't be tempted by warm snaps to get ahead of your frost date. Know and follow your frost date. So today is Tuesday. I hope to have this video out tomorrow or Thursday. And uh, Tuesday is a day when I have to drive a lot of kids to a lot of places. So anyway, now I am at uh, the park and Tuesday afternoons after I drop off my second kid, my boys have like an outdoor unschoolers park day. So it counts as PE for them. I and mean, if you want to think of it that way, it's a chance for them to get out and move their bodies in the outdoors and in nature that's not like in our garden. Now, I have been remiss in hanging out with the other parents because I feel like a little bit of a hermit in COVID life, but also just because I feel really, really overscheduled in modern, modern American life. I'm just scrambling from thing to thing to thing. And that means I often spend the time while my boys are playing and I have a view of the playground. I spend that time working either on phone calls, making video, editing video, um, answering emails, working on the responsibilities that I have in terms of caretaking for my father. And so I don't really like ha have downtime. Um, and that makes it really frustrating because I feel like I'm missing out on kind of a social aspect here. So I would like to maybe get to a point where I can prioritize hanging out with other parents for a while um, and having some good conversation. But uh, that probably won't be today. <laughs> there were a couple of packages on the front doorstep and one of them is a package that I've been waiting for for a few weeks and I wanted to share it with you all. It is my seed order this year from Fedco Seeds. Now I talked up Fedco last year. I really like them. They support um, sustainable seed production, support family farmers. They have a lot of organically grown seed options. Now buying organic seed may or may not be in the budget for you. It's often twice as expensive. It does mean you are supporting certified organic farming practices in the production of seed stock. And I think that's really um, pretty important if you can afford it. I can't always and sometimes the seed varieties that I really want I can't find in organic at all. Um, I think it's for me in terms of consumption of the fruits and veg I grow more important that I grow it using sustainable regenerative organic methods and that I take care of my own land that way. So I don't want you to feel that if you can't afford to purchase organic seeds, like you're somehow like shouldn't be gardening or you, you can't call the stuff that you grow organically grown, you absolutely can if you are using sustainable organic methods in the production of your food. Buying organic seed stock is a privilege, not everybody has it. So anyway, I'm gonna open these and talk through really quickly what I got. Oh, Fedco Seeds is in, um, is in Maine and that's going a long way all the way to Portland and that's okay I feel like seeds aren't very heavy and um, for me I support a number of other local seed producers but I really order some things from Fedco that I can't find anywhere else in fact uh, my favorite Fissilis seeds I just did a video on them and those seeds originally uh, came from Fedco so let's open this up here Part of the reason I wanted to make this video as soon as I possibly could is because I'm going to be making a number of videos about starting some of these because some of these seeds are specialty seeds and need certain careful instructions to be successful in germination. So I want to be sure that I have time to make a video and walk y'all through those steps. So I want to get these open and then get them planted as soon as I get home or maybe tomorrow. Okay, so let's look at the first packet here. Now with seeds, just keep in mind, there's usually far more than you can enjoy. So think about donating some to your local seed library or think about a community seed swap. Those are great ways to use up seeds because sometimes, you know, there might be two or 300 seeds in a packet and it's far more than an individual needs. Obviously, if you have good storage conditions, you can just store them until the next year if they have kind of like they're a little bit longer longevity. 
So I ordered a couple of unusual crops that you might not have heard of, and I'm gonna make videos on all of these separately. The first one is skirret. Let's see if the sunshine will cooperate here. Skirret. Now, skirret is kind of a uh, quintessential permaculture root vegetable. It is kind of an ancient uh, veggie that was grown in Europe a lot and is really difficult to find in the United States. I've been looking for probably 15 years for root divisions of it or seeds of it, and it's really hard to source. It's not got a lot of commercial viability because the, the roots are very thin and it's kind of a lot of work um, in terms of preparing them. So they just aren't as commonly grown, but I think they have a really nice flavor and I'm always looking to diversify the number of crops I have, particularly more unusual ones that there's no way I can get it at the grocery store. So I'm gonna try this skirt. I'll be making a video on that in detail later. Another great permaculture one I got was Good King Henry. Good King Henry, another permaculture plant. There used to be a uh, kind of like homestead in Northeast Portland in the Cully neighborhood called Discount Permaculture way before we bought our house. And I think they've since moved to Hawaii. And um, they were really big into growing Good King Henry. This is a leafy green perennial vegetable. And um, well, that's great. That makes it like, not really a caloric crop. It is a great addition to add another green to your diet can be kind of fiddly to start from seed, and I've had no luck sourcing this before now, so you can get both Skirret and Good King Henry from Fedco. Not that other folks haven't carried those seeds in their catalog, they're just always out of stock, so um, it may be something that has kind of low availability. So this next one I got is also kind of a permaculture darling, and this is one of my favorite veggies, and unfortunately my chickens destroyed my largest patch of it, and before that, I actually dug up and gave away my other large patch of it. I used to grow it in the very front of my front yard. And as summers are getting hotter and drier here, it was kind of struggling in that super sunny, dry area. And so um, I gave away root divisions and kind of got rid of that bed and thought, well, I'm safe. I have another large patch of this in the backyard. And my poultry killed it all. Um, I, if you've watched any of my videos, you know that there have been multiple instances where uh, my chickens got out and destroyed a much beloved perennial. So just keep in mind, if you are free ranging your chickens, um, make sure that you think about a rotational poultry paddock system like I use, but also that your kids don't leave the gates open or that you have gates that secure really, really well in high wind conditions, because both of those factors have, uh, lost me several beloved perennials, including this one. So I'm restarting it. And this is a fussy, fussy girl to start. This is sea kale, cranberry maritima. Really cool leaves. It's really um, high wind resistant and really salt resistant. It is a perennial kale. And I really like the flowers deep fried as a fritter, but the roots are also really tasty. Just a really cool plant. Difficult to start from seed. And I think that's why it can be um, hard to find in American gardens because it's fussy. So I will definitely have a whole video on that. So I also got some sweet peas. My sweet peas always end up reverting back to kind of like a purpley color, kind of like the, uh, the parent after a few years. So if I want those specialty colors, I need to buy seeds. Um, these are a little late getting started. I preferably would have started sweet peas a month ago, but that's okay. They'll catch up and I'll plant them in a shady location in case it's a hot spring. Um, um, I have new basil seeds, more Genovese basil. I've had a really difficult time sourcing lovage, and I have one plant of it left in my garden. It is a perennial, but I have not had success getting it to go to seed very reliably. So I haven't been able to collect the seed. And that means as a number of my perennial plants have gotten kind of old and died, or maybe got shaded out in my food forest, I'm down to one lovage plant and I don't have a reliable seed production. So I bought lovage seeds. Lovage is a perennial celery relative. It's like celery, but about 10 times stronger. So you just need a little bit in your um, soup or stew, or if you're sauteing with onions, just a little bit goes a long way, but it is a very early spring vegetable. So I'll have more on that. Next, I ordered a couple kinds of peas I haven't grown before. Now, these are a little late getting going as well. In my zone, zone 8B, you could have started peas a month ago if you wanted to, right in the ground. I tend to err on the side of starting my peas a little bit later, and that makes it so that there's less slug predation. I turn my ducks and chickens out into the part of the garden that I want to plant my peas in and let them strip that area of slugs and slug eggs, and then I can come back 
back in and plant my peas afterward. And I found I have greater success that way. So I'm trying two new kinds of peas. This is green arrow shell pea, and these are certified organic. And then I'm doing green beauty snow pea. Now, if you notice on these, this one is a 60 day pea. And this one is a 65 day peak. I historically grow Alderman Tall Telephone. I think they're really beautiful. And some peas that have a longer, um, longer number of days to maturity. Because we have been having dr drier springs and summers and it's been getting hotter earlier, I am going to be switching more and more to shorter season, shorter uh, day to maturity peas. And in that way, I can ensure a successful crop because peas, after it's about 80 degrees out, they tank really hard. And I love to eat shell peas and snow peas. And I also love to saute or make a stir fry of pea sprouts. Pea sprouts with um, some pesto on them. Oh, so good as a stir fry. So I want to get those shorter season varieties that I know I'm going to get all of the harvest out of them before the weather turns too hot and kills them off. Okay, so one last packet. I don't actually order that many seeds. I think I spent about 40 bucks, 40 bucks on seeds maybe this year. And that was a little bit of a splurge because I always want to try new things so I can share them with you all on YouTube. And um, occasionally it's because I am purchasing seeds from hybrids. So it's not something I can save myself. I try to save a lot of my own seeds if I possibly can, like all my winter squash. I make sure I hand pollinate and save those seeds. But for hybrids, I can't do that. So I made a video on these last fall and I've ordered more. These are naked bear pumpkins. Naked Bear is a hybrid and you eat the seeds. This is a pepita pumpkin. They have a hullless seed that is delicious. So check out my video on those if you're interested in growing them. Uh, Fedco is one of the few places that stocks it consistently. I know a number of other folks are already out of stock and they're cheaper than the other places I look. So I'm trying a few new things this year. I'm trying Velour Bush Erico Ver beans. I really love me a skinny green bean and I really have had good success with purple varieties. I find that just like uh, slugs don't like red lettuce as much as green lettuce, they don't like purple bush beans as much as green ones. So they turn green when you cook them. Um, I love that they have a purpley color to the foliage and those kind of pale uh, lavender colored flowers. And the beans taste the same, less slug damage. That's been my experience. I'm always trying to grow new kinds of soup beans. So this year I got this kind of pole bean, true red cranberry. I love cranberry pole beans. I haven't grown them in a long time and I've not tried this variety. My goal is always to grow enough pole beans that we can enjoy one dinner for our family of six that is solely uh, out of dried beans that I grow in the garden. And that usually means one large trellis, like one of my cattle panel arches. If I cover that in pole beans, I will get a large enough crop at the end of the year that we can have one dinner of bean soup. So uh, it's not like I am growing to sustain us through the winter off of the beans in my quarter acre garden. I feel like that is the amount of space I can justify giving. And that it makes it a token experience, but that doesn't make it any less valuable. It feels really good to say, even on our small property, I grew enough beans to feed my large family and uh, we are enjoying a meal that totally came out of our ground. We planted the seeds, we nourished the vines as they grew, we harvested, shelled, stored them, and then made a meal with them. That's a really good uh, nourishing process, not only for our bodies, but also just in terms of the fulfillment of being able to labor with our hands and enjoy the things that we have produced. Two other things I am trying this year. I am trying a new variety of zucchini, cocozel, which is supposed to be quite good. I usually just grow black beauty. Sometimes I grow other varieties of summer squash. I don't really like patty pans. I feel like they're nice when they're really tiny, but they get over mature really quickly. So I'm really a fan of zucchini. So I'm gonna try and grow these along in, along with my traditional black beauties that I always grow. And then I have jumped on the train of growing <clears throat> Mexican sour gherkins. I love any kind of cucumber, and I also really love anything that's got a sour and tart astringent kind of green apple-y flavor, so I'm going to give these a try. I also think they look really beautiful in the garden, and they'll look great grown up over one of my cattle panel arches. So that's my whole seed order right here, and I feel pretty good about that. I would love to hear what kinds of things you're trying. 
that are new for you this year, what kinds of things are staples that you enjoy and order every year, and what your favorite seed catalogs are. Um, thanks for watching with me, and please tune back over the next two weeks because I will have a number of videos about starting some of these specialty seeds in the garden in a way that sets us up for success because some of these are fiddly to get going from seed and they require special techniques. It's really good that we know and understand the strategies to make us more successful gardeners. If we have a high rate of germination and a high rate of success, that means we have more plants that we can share with our neighbors if we have too many for our own garden. So it's a win all the way around. I hope that you are staying warm if you are in the Pacific Northwest. I hope that your plants are going to make it through this cold snap, and I will be back later this week. You are welcome to check out my Patreon down in the description, or if you enjoy my videos, you can throw a couple of bucks at my PayPal and say thanks, Angela. Okay, I'll be back.